few days ago, I made a very general guide about Brewmaster relating to Mythic Plus. While I felt like I covered pretty much all of the basics, there is definitely a lot more nuance in the class, and because of that, I definitely left a lot of you with a few unanswered questions. So in this video, I wanted to do a Q&A style video covering more specifics about the class. I'm going to cover a few different topics, including damage optimizations, burst window, situational talent changes, and macros for Brewmaster. I also posted on YouTube yesterday asking if there's anything else I should cover, and you guys left me with a few, so I'm going to cover all of that in this video. Feel free to use the timeline navigation tool if you'd like. I also plan on doing a lot more Brewmaster-centric content in the future, so if I miss something in this video, leave a comment below or hit me up in my Discord and I'll try to answer it there or in a future video. I think the most amount of comments and messages that I got were in relation to the comment I made about playing without Tiger Palm on your bar, so I really wanted to take some time to clarify that. It was mainly for players who felt like there was way too many buttons to hit, so let's dive into this topic. Coming at this from a truly DPS gain standpoint, Tiger Palm doesn't make sense to hit when you are running the talent Counter-Strike accompanied with the talent Shard Passions. I want to make this abundantly clear though, if you're playing Dragonfire Brew instead of Shard Passions or you're deciding not to run Counter-Strike, this doesn't really matter at all. But for those who are unaware, or at least don't recall what Counter-Strike does, whenever you dodge an attack, your next Tiger Palm or Spitting Crin Kick will deal 100% more damage. Charred Passions is a buff that is applied for 8 seconds after every single cast of Breath of Fire, and this buff causes your Spinning Crane Kick to deal 50% additional damage as fire damage. Again, purely from a DPS standpoint, even in single target, Spinning Crane Kick does more damage on average than even an empowered Tiger Palm. If you cast Tiger Palm, you are gambling for layered RNG on a Counter Strike proc, on a Face Palm damage imp, and on top of a Critical Strike. In a very short 1 minute testing, you can see the average Tiger Palm here cast did about 10.6k damage. Even at the highest end, you're seeing a 25.5k hit as a Critical Strike. But on the low end, you're seeing just a 5k normal hit. Now, we did the same thing, but instead of hitting Tiger Palm as our filler, let's hit it with a Charred Passion Spinning Crane Kick. We're trying to see if the average Spinning Crane Kick cast does more than 10.6k. For those who aren't aware, Spinning Crane Kick does hit the target 4 times. In just a, again, a 1 minute test, the average hit does 2.8k, so we're going to want to multiply that by 4, which is 11.2k per cast, which is clearly a little bit better. I feel like we should also point out that the critical strike was a little higher, which you can boil down to RNG, but then we also need to keep in mind that we haven't calculated the bonus damage from Charred Passions, which added additional 2k damage per hit, and it hit 59 times. Now, it hit a few more times than our spinning crane kick did on the 52, because Blackout Kick does also get damage amps from Charred Passions. So even in single target, as long as you are playing and maintaining Charred Passions, spinning crane kick does significantly more damage than a single Tiger Palm. Now, of course, we want to keep in mind that there is a defensive benefit for Tiger Palm, which is that it reduces a cooldown of all your brews by one second. This includes both Purifying Brew and Celestial Brew alongside Bonus Brew and Fort Brew. While this can be impactful, we know that you're now sacrificing a lot of damage, especially once you just add that one additional target. Tiger Palm is currently situational at best. And with how GCD locked the Brewmaster rotation is while playing Charred Passions, it's very difficult to weave in more than just a few Tiger Palms per minute, which means that you're only gaining about 4-6 to six seconds on average of Purifying Brew and Celestial Brew, which will probably never be the difference between timing and failing a key. Even if you don't play Light Brewing and opt into Training of Nazao like I do, the Keg Smash cooldown recovery alone seems like enough to keep up Purified Cheese Stacks, and it still keeps you on pace for a consistent 9-10 to 10 stack Celestial Brew while fully optimizing your damage. Now, I can't stress this enough, this is only the case if you play both Counter-Strike and Charred Passions. If you decide not to play Counter-Strike, or decide just to play Dragonfire Brew instead, Tiger Palm becomes equally as valuable in single target. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this section, but I do want to hit a few talking points regarding priority. Keg Smash is now going to be your top damage, and you're going to want to be using this ability whenever possible. There is never a time you want to have two charges of Keg Smash saved up while in combat. Because of this, it's important you have enough energy to cast these abilities. In higher level content, this is typically easier to do thanks to the talent High Tolerance. But just in case you can't Keg Smash this immediate second, you're going to want to fill that global with a non-energy spending ability. This includes reapplying Rushing Jade Wind or using Rising Sun Kick, Blackout Kick, or Chi Wave. Keep in mind that both Tiger Palm and Spinning Crane Kick cost less energy, so you shouldn't be using these if you need to Keg Smash. So I want to try to simplify things. Keg Smash simply takes priority over any ability. Most of the time you can probably get into the habit of following all of your Keg Smashes with Breath of Fire. 
Early on in the poll, you can typically prioritize other impactful abilities, but once the poll gets rolling, Keg Smash should be on cooldown for about six to seven seconds, which is perfect since that the duration of Charred Passions is about eight seconds. So you can always do a Keg Smash followed by Breath of Fire, followed by a Spinning Crane Kick. When it comes to pure damage, an AoE Black Oak Kick will typically deal more damage than Rising Sun Kick, and it's going to give us stacks of Elusive Brawler, which feeds into Counter Strike, amplifying your Spinning Crane Kick damage, but Rising Sun Kick is still important. RSK is a great filler spell if you need energy since it doesn't cost you anything to actually cast, and it has a chance to generate a healing sphere. While there's an argument to be made that it should never be cast in AoE, I just generally disagree. It definitely can provide a little bit more damage for those empty globals, and there are just natural points in your rotation where you're going to need something to hit, and RSK is the perfect ability for that. A few of you asked about Chi Wave, and I don't really have a great answer for it. The damage that Chi Wave does is pretty meh. On average, it does a little less than Blackout Kick and Single Target, and that doesn't really change in any type of AoE scenario. This is just a button you can hit to either pull in a range mob or use on the very rare occasion when Blackout Kick and Rising Sun Kick are both on cooldown and you need energy for some reason. This typically happens more often in lower keys, but essentially it's a global filler. Using my current talents as a base, let's talk about a few changes you can make depending on a key. One of the easiest drops is Detox, and this is going to be in kind of the first tier of your tree. I originally suggested having this, but it's really only needed in a few instances including Algothar Academy for the overgrown ancient boss encounter, and Shadow Moon Burial Ground while clearing the bats and spiders towards the back half while you're going towards Bone Maw. That means we can easily drop this talent and put it elsewhere if needed. Generous Pour is a great pickup here, and it will provide you and your allies within 10 yards 2% avoidance per stack. Very rarely will this actually make a large difference, and it honestly depends on your composition. If you're playing in an all range group for example, this talent is kinda useless. The best dungeon talent for this though is like typically Azure Vault. Another decent pickup is Hasty Provocation, which gives Provoke its enemy speed boost again. This can be really helpful in certain dungeons like the Naku Defensive, especially near and around the third boss area, to make sure you can keep the bosses together, and you can keep certain trash mobs out of the AoE buff that they get. You can always pick up an extra charge of roll or bounce back if you ever feel like you're going to need it, but those type of things start to become really minor. Regarding some changes in the spec tree, there are a few different builds, but I really wouldn't suggest changing anything. Notably, I run Training of Nazao, but I suggest new brewmasters play Light Brewing instead. If you find yourself wanting to hit Celestial Brew and Purifying Brew more often, you can always drop Weapons of Order for Blackout Combo. If you do this, your priority will be following every Blackout Kick with a Keg Smash if you can help it. This will push your Celestial Brew down to an extremely short cooldown. And once you start getting more comfortable with the damage intake and using Healing Spheres with Expel Harm, you can actually drop Blackout Combo, or you can swap to Training of Nazao. So for the burst rotation, I'm going to just assume that you're playing this exact build here. I'm going to walk you guys through how I do my opener in fresh pulls. Uh, first, I'm going to kind of like reverse engineer this, and then I'll kind of get into an actual analytical breakdown. Now, there are times that I will change this based on this, you know, pull size or cooldowns that I currently have available. But since we're playing Weapons of Order, this is going to give all targets hit by Keg Smash a debuff that makes them take 8% more damage, and this stacks up to four times. Our largest hitting abilities will be Exploding Keg accompanied with Bone Dust Brew. So in an ideal situation, we're going to be using Bone Dust Brew with an Exploding Keg once we have all of our enemies at least at 3-4 to four sacks of this debuff. This will happen naturally as you ramp, and the majority of your damage should happen around 10-15 to 15 seconds into the pull. Right before pulling, let's apply our Rushing Jade Wind, and then we're going to use Keg Smash followed by Breath of Fire. And now that we've used Charge of Keg Smash, it's time to refill that charge by hitting Weapons of Order. We will then follow this with a Spitting Crane Kick, followed by a Refresh on Breath of Fire, then a Blackout Kick followed by Keg Smash. The main reason for doing Breath of Fire followed by Blackout Kick is really to make sure we're, we have enough energy to Keg Smash again. We also need to remember that even during our Burst Windows, we want to maintain our Rushing Jade Wind and our Brewmaster's Rhythm. At this point, we're going to Bone Dust Brew, Spinning Crane Kick followed by another Breath of Fire, and then a Keg Smash again. At this point, we now have three stacks of the Weapons of Order debuff applied to our enemy. We can keep going, but it's another five seconds until our fourth Keg Smash, so let's opt into using our Exploding Keg here. This is a conscious choice that you have to make if you want an earlier burst, or you can wait it out. As soon as we cast Exploding Keg, we're going to want to follow it with a Spinning Crane Kick since Exploding Keg makes our attacks deal an additional 2.5k fire damage. It's really important here that we have both Shard Passions and Rushing Jade Wind is active when we Exploding Keg for maximum burst. Keep in mind that because this example is on training dummies, we're not really benefiting from our training of Nazao nor our Counter-Strike talent choices. During keys, the damage from this opener will be slightly higher, uh, about 8%. Outside of Button Bloat, my biggest problem personally with Brewmaster Monk is just how many ground targeting abilities that we have, especially in our burst rotation. 
We have things like Bonus Brew Exploding Keg and White Tiger Statue, and of course we also have Ring of Peace as a utility option. While placing Ring is fine, and you know, I honestly prefer being very deliberate with my placement, but when it comes to my damage opener, I like to minimize the amount of button pressing or clicks I need to do. Now, these macros aren't going to make you play any better and definitely have a downside to them, but I found them to be extremely helpful. Originally, I used to use an at cursor macro, but after one too many missed exploding kegs, I instead opt to utilize an at player macro. First, the macro template looks like this. On our first line, we have show tooltip. And then secondly, we have slash cast, open bracket, at player, close bracket, bone dust brew. You don't need to replace the word player with anything. The macro being set up like this means that the bone dust brew will always be casted at the caster's feet. There are some issues with this, obviously. For example, if you're kiting mobs or the pack is kind of spread out for some reason, you may not apply this effect to every mob. But as a tank player, you're typically in the thick of it, and I found that in most cases you do hit everything. I have duplicate macros for this for Exploding Keg and White Tiger Statue. This means that I never have to worry about clicking during the most important part of my damage rotation. Obviously, the main issue with Brewmaster is the insane amount of button bloat. I know that some players don't feel this way about the class, but I'm referring to the majority of players that I do hear from that just say it's too much, especially for new players, so let's sympathize with them a bit. One macro type that I really enjoy using is called Modifier Macros. Essentially what this does is it allows you to bundle abilities into the same macro or keybind, and then you can use either Control, Alt, or Shift to change the keybind when you hold it down. So an example of this will look like this. We have Show Tooltip, and then on the next line we have Slash Cast, Open Bracket, mod colon alt as the modifier and then we're going to close that bracket and we're going to do vivify here then we're going to use semicolon followed by healing elixir i use this currently on my brewmaster and it works in two different instances since i play with healing elixir i made a macro that's going to use this ability but if i hold down the alt key since it's the modifier key it changes that same keybind to vivify the reason i do this is that vivify rarely gets used in combat but it can still be useful in a lot of different situations when you need to like off heal during Grievous Weeks or help your healer top players after a pull finishes. This also reduces the amount of keybinds I need to use down to one, which is just great. You can do the same thing with almost every ability in the game, but I only recommend doing it with things that you don't hit often enough, and Vivify is a great example of that. The only other ability pairing I have similar with a macro like this is Diffuse Magic with Zen Meditation. My Diffuse Magic keybind is hit very often during a key, but Zen Meditation is definitely used a little less frequently and is normally only ever used to counter very specific tank busters. Therefore, I can press and hold Alt to use this without it cluttering up my already very full action bars. Alright, this is going to be kind of like the last section, but I made a post yesterday on YouTube asking if you guys had any questions I could cover in this video, and I'm going to try to just do like a rapid fire section here. One of you asked add-ons for tracking stagger, red, yellow, etc. There aren't a lot of add-ons that I'm aware of that do this, but weak ores would be your kind of go-to here. If you go to wago.io and search stagger, you'll find a ton of different options here that you can import into your game. This is what I originally did before I ended up making my own weak ore package. Another one of you asked how many keybinds do you have? So my brewmaster currently has 40 active keybinds. Now I'm not going to get into the specifics here, but about... 10 of them are rotational, 8 are cooldown based, and the rest are somewhat like utility, off healing, whatever it might be. Tank busters or moments when you use Zen Meditation. So Zen Meditation has a super long cooldown, it's about 5 minutes to be exact. This makes it very difficult to use in a lot of different scenarios, but it's definitely worth fitting in when you can. But the bosses that I notably use them on would be the Arcane Cleave from Azure Blade in the Azure Vault. I also use it on the Jade Serpent Strike from Lou Flameheart in Temple of the Jade Serpent. Shield of Light from Hersia in Halls of Valor, and the Arcane Expulsion from Veximus in Algothar Academy. This is going to change a lot for a lot of different players, but it's really good to become super comfortable hitting this as a defensive. How does Blackout Combo work? Does it empower only one button press of the next ability, or are all abilities empowered? And if only one button press gets empowered, is it not awkward to cast Empowered Breath of Fire? You would have to line up the CD to get the extra 5% DR. Any tips appreciated. So Blackout Combo is a pretty dope talent, but can definitely have some confusing aspects to it when trying to optimize it. Basically, whenever you cast a Blackout Kick, you're going to gain a buff called Blackout Combo. If you want to track this buff with a weak ore, you can definitely do so. This buff will cause your next ability to be empowered with these additional effects. If you press a Tiger Palm, it's going to deal 100% increased damage. If you press Breath of Fire, the tooltip is incorrect here, and it's actually going to do 50% increased upfront damage, and then it's also going to add an additional 5% damage reduction to the debuff. 
If you press keg smash, it's gonna reduce the remaining cooldowns of your brew by an additional two seconds, meaning that you're gonna get five seconds off of all of your brews. If you hit Celestial Brew following a Blackout Kick, you're gonna gain three additional stacks of Purified Chi. And if you press Purifying Brew, it's going to pause the stagger damage dot on you for three seconds. Now to answer your question, it will only empower your next casted ability. So if you were to cast a Blackout Kick followed by a Tiger Palm, your Tiger Palm cast will consume the buff, and that Tiger Palm will deal 100% more damage on that specific cast following that Blackout Kick. I'm going to do a full video on this since it's going to take me like several minutes to actually explain all the nuances of this ability and how to optimize it. Essentially, you typically want to prioritize Keg Smash following any of your Blackout Kicks, but using any of the abilities are fine. Sometimes you might Blackout Kick while Keg Smash is still on cooldown, so you can either delay the buff by using filler spells, but honestly, an Empowered Breath of Fire is still going to be impactful, or even if you want to pause your stagger. Again, I plan on doing a full video dedicated to playing around Blackout Combo, so keep an eye out for that. The last question was really asking about my opinions of Brewmaster and how it feels. As a Warrior main, I would love to hear how Brewmaster feels to you versus other tanks now in the meta. What breakpoint in gear feels like it's good at the moment, and how big is 4 set for BM? I don't want to dig too deep here because my rants typically can get quite long and so is this video, but as some of you might know, I started the season as a Warrior main, but that quickly got tiring. The gameplay for me personally felt like it was very stale and mundane, and honestly it felt like there was a lack of skill expression that some other tanks could provide, like Brewmaster. I played Brewmaster as an alt since Battle for Azeroth, but finally decided to main it this season. Compared to Warrior, there are still some weak points, but it's mostly when it comes down to heavy magical damage intake. But with some of the recent buffs that we got to damage mitigation along with increased healing sphere generation, it feels as tanky as ever. Warrior is undoubtedly strong, but there's no reason a serious Brewmaster player can't compete. Regarding breakpoints and four set, I started feeling pretty stable around the 390 item level mark and took another step up once I broke that 410, which I actually did this week. The 4 set for Brewmaster is really only good and higher end content when you can purify a ton of damage. I just obtained 4 set yesterday and I haven't had the chance to step into anything higher than some like 18 pugs. My group plans on pushing this upcoming weekend and we have some 22s and 23s laying around so maybe I'll get to talk about this much more in the future. I think that covers all the major questions or comments that I've received. If I missed anything, or if you need any further clarification, leave a comment down below. I'll do my best to try to answer everything there, or I will probably turn it into a video. I do stream on Twitch, so check me out there for any tank-related content, and of course, massive shout out to all my Patreons, because without them, there'd be much less of this, so thank you guys. I hope you're all staying happy, healthy, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Peace.